Welcome to season three of Overcoming Working Mum Burnout. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Kerr, mum, behavior scientist, and burnout survivor. I interview DEI leadership and mental health experts to uncover burnout solutions at the individual, family, work, and cultural levels. When mums thrive, the world benefits. In this week's episode, I'm learning from Mita Malik, who is the co-host of the Brown Table Talk podcast. She writes thought-provoking posts on LinkedIn and is the head of inclusion at Carter. She draws from her own experiences of not belonging as a child and later in the workplace. She didn't always know how to speak out, but once she found her voice, she's been a dedicated advocate for change. Mita's advice is always very practical and to the point. And in this episode, she poses quite simple questions that we can all ask ourselves to see what more we could do to be advancing belonging and preventing burnout. As I mentioned, one of Mita's superpowers is that she's very succinct. So this episode is shorter than my normal episodes. And as you know, I do not have that superpower. I'm always very long-winded. So I'm just going to take a minute here to introduce you to a new training and peer learning collaborative that I'm developing starting in 2023. And if you listen in at the end, I'm going to provide some more details. Like me, are you passionate about helping other women leaders and frustrated by the status quo for women at work? Are you disappointed by the band-aids we're applying to problems like bias and burnout? which affect women's ability to rise. Women are spending more time on these issues, but are not being rewarded or recognized for this work. And when women try to suggest systems solutions, their ideas are dismissed. In When Women Lead, Julia Boston showed that VC-backed successful women leaders are disruptive instead of the quick fixes preferred by men. They see both the forest and the trees and get to the root causes of problems. I want to give women the confidence and credibility to lead in this way and build upon their intuition with science-backed leadership strategies. The five evidence-based strategies for my science are leading through complexity with compassion, micro and macro problem solving lessons from public health, leading with impact, using behavior change science to create systems change, leading with insight, creating the conditions for successful culture change, leading with curiosity, using peer learning collaboratives to support experimenting, and finally, leading with clarity, managing burnout so you and those you lead can thrive through change. In conjunction with my leadership training, I'm facilitating small groups of women executives in peer learning collaboratives. This is a scientific process that is used in medicine when important new recommendations need to be put into practice and there's likely to be pushback. Peer learning collaboratives leverage the supportive environment of group coaching, but with more targeted goals, greater accountability and a quality improvement process that measures impact through learning cycles. They provide a safe environment for women to put their new skills and strategies into action while learning from other women leading similar change efforts in their organization. Does this resonate with you? Would it help women you know? Please stay on at the end and I'll provide some more details or just direct message me on LinkedIn and I can provide you more details there. Okay, now to meet his episode and I hope you learn as much as I did. Hi, I'm Mita Malik. I am mom to Jay, who is nine, and Priya, who is six, and we live in Jersey City, New Jersey, and I am currently the head of inclusion for CARTA. Great. Thank you so much for your time today, Mita. And as I was saying, maybe the best thing I could do on overcoming working mom burnout is provide an hour of sleep for mums instead of a conversation. <laughs> but I'm so glad you're here today. Please describe your journey to where you are now in your career and some of the multiple roles that you actually play today. My journey starts. I'm the proud daughter of Indian immigrant parents. My younger brother and I were born and raised outside of Boston. And I always tell people that I was the funny looking dark skinned girl with the long, funny looking braid 
whose parents spoke funny English until it wasn't funny anymore. And I was bullied a lot, both verbally and physically by my peers growing up. They made it clear to me every day that I did not belong in that community. Coupled with the fact that I did not grow up in the Instagram era, so I didn't see myself reflected, products and services, commercials, movies. And so that really drove Jacqueline, my interest in marketing. I didn't know that it was marketing at the time. I didn't have the language, but it was really this idea of whose stories get told and why, who makes those choices and why do people like me not get included? And so I went into a long career as a marketer working for very large consumer product goods companies, whether that was Johnson and Johnson, Avon, Unilever, Pfizer, and then most recently entered into tech. And I always say inclusion found me. It's been my life's purpose. I just don't want anyone to ever feel like they don't belong, whether that's in playgrounds or in companies. And it's interesting you say that in some ways, the era that we are now living in has given voice to so many other people. It's not just the media gatekeepers who get to present stories through social media. There are other stories being represented. And that's what's so exciting to be living in the time we're in. I know there's a lot going on in the world right now and progress is slow. And yet I'm so inspired by all the voices I get to hear, I get to learn from. I get to be part of their community. That's how we got to know each other through LinkedIn. And so I think that's amazing. So maybe describe a little bit how motherhood might have changed or influenced your career or your whole approach to life. How did you experience that? I was pretty naive. I wanted to be a mother. Don't we all want to be a great mother, a great wife, a great friend, a great partner, a great leader? I wanted to do all of those things. And I wanted to show up for all the many people in my life like we all want to do. And I never thought I would be mommy tracked. It wasn't something that I had considered. And all of the everyday aggressions, the comments, how was your vacation when you had been out on leave for the first time birthing a human being, not knowing what that was going to be like. Or I remember one time very clearly being up for a very big role that required travel and my former manager sitting me down saying, you have two small kids at home. There's no way you're going to be able to do that job and taking my name off the slate. And I never had the courage, Jacqueline, in the moment to say, who gave you permission to slow down my career? Who gave you permission to slow down my career? And so I never really anticipated how my identity as a mother would be received in the workplace. And so I have a lot of stories of where that's held me back. I do think now, now that I'm more senior, I feel like a responsibility to talk openly about being a mother who also wants to be a great mother and a great leader. And hopefully that allows others to do the same. It is challenging when you do feel that sense of responsibility as time goes on, but it also adds to the burden that you're facing as a mom to support those coming through. So have you ever experienced burnout in your career or do you find ways to manage it because you're very aware of it? It's funny you mentioned this because I wrote this piece for Motherly during the pandemic, which gosh, we're like two years into it now. I've been working from my bedroom in Jersey City. I would say I've had the privilege of working from home where I know many of our frontline workers haven't had a choice and they've helped our economies keep going. I've been in a perpetual state of burnout. I think I'm just seeing the other side of that. But I think when many of us had our children being homeschooled, virtual schooled by us, I always say I was the failed teacher, the failed summer camp counselor, (laughs) the chief entertainment officer, the referee, the cook, all of that while still trying to work. There's not a break when you're perpetually burned out. It was just like the match that had gone out that had the flicker and would come back and then flicker off and on. That's how I felt because our entire support system had been ripped out from under us. When were any of us who were caregiving going to find time for ourselves? When we were isolated, we had no one to ask for help. It was just us. And so you have many different roles in your life, including your new podcast. So tell me a little bit more about that podcast so that listeners can go listen to that as well. I listened in and really love it. And what made you start it and what do you hope to achieve through it? 
Yeah, thank you so much for asking about it. Brown Table Talk is the name of our podcast. I'm a passionate storyteller. I hadn't ever considered audio as a format, but my good friend D and I were talking about this podcast for two years and finally did it. And it's really a reflection of our friendship, which is our stories, our journey, our struggles to go from surviving to thriving as women of color in the corporate spaces in which we navigate. And it's really our gift and our hope to lift as many women of color as possible. I always say this is the podcast I wish I had when I was younger. All the stories that many of us talk about privately, but not publicly, and we can't change what we don't discuss. And we need allies to be hearing these stories. Anyone who's on a journey to be an ally is to understand what it means to have your work repeatedly stolen. How does it feel to be constantly mistaken for the other brown woman? What do you do when you see someone called or referred to as a diversity hire? I mean, all of these things are happening in our workspaces every single day. So what can we do differently? And that's what we hope to leave people with. Thank you so much. And I love that you provide very clear, concrete advice at the end of the episodes. It's so helpful because again, we can learn from the stories and have takeaways, but you really tie it down at the end and it feels so actionable. So I really appreciate that. And so for example, in one of the episodes, you're talking about the extra office work that women might be taking on. And that for me relates very much to burnout in the person doing this extra work, but also for the whole team, which is women are taking on the role of supporting the team's well-being. And that is an additional task that is not included in performance reviews, even though I think team well-being is such an important key performance indicator. So in terms of that, in all the spheres that you're working in on LinkedIn, in your daily job and in the podcast and your experience with that, how are you seeing burnout in the spheres that you're working in? And what do you think would make a a difference? There's burnout on so many levels. There's the real impact people are feeling from the two pandemics we're living in, the other pandemic of racism whether you identify as Black or Asian American, it is really unbelievable, I think, what's happening with hate crimes right now from a U.S. perspective, and I know globally as well. So that is impacting individuals' state of well-being and also leading with burnout when you see continuously people from your community who are being murdered. So think about the impact that can have. I think also, as I talk about not the great resignation, but the great awakening People are just no longer going to take working in toxic work environments. And so there's healing that has to happen when you're leaving. I also think what I'm seeing is downsizing as a result of the pandemic, resources being cut, and people taking on more and more work, those of us who are still left on the team. And so I think burnout is happening on all sorts of levels. And I think, Jacqueline, to your point, it's like, it's all of our jobs to care, isn't it? It's all of our jobs to care and check in on people. Like, why is it the same person that you're expecting to step up and care? Why can't we be sharing that responsibility? And do you have ideas in terms of systems changes or do you see this as individuals should just be, how do we change that? How do we change into a more caring society versus quite an individualistic one that we're in? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Kindness is a choice. Kindness is a choice. And I think right now to any leader listening, there's no greater retention tool that you have access to than kindness. I will tell you, if you show up for an employee in their darkest hour, in their time of need, there is no amount of money that you can offer for that loyalty they will feel. If you have shown up for me during my darkest time and we have that trust and you've had my back and you've shown me kindness, Someone can come with an extra $30,000. It's really unlikely that I'm going to leave because you have made me feel seen and heard and like I belong. You've made me feel human. And so I think to all the leaders out there, anyone who's leading teams, like what is stopping you from being kind? And I always say hurt people hurt people. So if you think you have to lead by being unkind, by being mean, by being ruthless, ask yourself why that is. And there's probably some personal work and self-reflection we need to do there. Thank you for putting it in that way, because I think 
in some ways leaders feel paralyzed in this moment. There hasn't been a pandemic before. There hasn't been a great resignation or awakening before. There hasn't been this level of burnout before. And I feel like they're paralyzed and going, we don't know what to do. Whereas I'm like, great, experiment. This is the time to find out what might work because that's okay. It's okay to admit you don't know what to do. But I just think that call that you made there for kindness almost transcends all of that. It can. And I always say I can be kind and I can still be fair and strong and decisive. Kindness is not about being weak and being a pushover. And I think for too often, I'll say personally, like I've gotten the feedback, you're being too nice. You're being too kind. What does that mean? I want to be kind. Why is that some sort of negative quality? I think, especially I would say as a woman, something that's been in my experience, feedback that I've been given that seems negative, but I think the pandemic has totally shifted all of that. Yeah, I hope so. And again, that's the question you can turn around with is don't you value kindness? How would you want to be treated? What is that old saying? Do unto others how you would want done to you and treat people how you would like to be treated is the golden rule and how I'm trying to raise my children. So one of the groups that are struggling, I think I see two groups in particular, is it feels like the managers who are stuck in between the C-suite who are still having expectations for managers and then managers are really trying to help their employees. So I feel like they're stuck in a position of having a lot of burnout. But another group that I see is the DEI officers out there. They're trying to make this monumental change in organizations with very few resources. So how can we really support that mental health of our DEI officers? Take on the work with them. Don't show up to an organization, Jacqueline, with a cape and a magic wand to fix this and fix whatever. My team and I were a catalyst for change, but we can't do it alone. We need every single person to act like they're a chief diversity officer. So what I would ask of you is to think about as a leader, what are the ways in which you can be making impact in this space? How can you be helping reaching out to your team that runs DEI and says, what can I be personally doing? Have you asked that question? What can I be personally doing to help you with this work? And it, it can be a myriad of things, but have you asked that question? And have you thought about what your responsibility is to be an inclusive leader? versus relegating that and thinking, oh, that's the job of the DEI team or the people team or the legal team or whoever else. It's not my job. And so I think that's really important. I don't think many people understand the level of burnout in these roles. For me, I identify as a brown woman, as a caregiver, I identify in, in many other ways as well. And I am also fighting for issues on the behalf of the company and on behalf of colleagues that I am personally experiencing. And so that is what makes this job really sometimes heavy and makes it exhausting. I do love how you just, in the same way as you do in your podcast, you break it down so succinctly to a very actionable thing. Ask that question. What can I be doing to help you? That is just so great. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And let me give you some very quick few examples. You don't have to be a people leader to be doing this work. Let's say there's an opening on your team. Maybe it's not your direct report, maybe it's for a peer. You're waiting for a diverse slate from who? Start asking around through your networks. Start sourcing people, right? What are you waiting for? Someone to come with a magic wand and give you a list of 10 amazing candidates? You can do that work. What about if you're going to record a video, something for work, and you need to hire an agency? Why do we go to the same five agencies? Why don't you find a Black-owned business? Somebody who has video work as their expertise, someone who you can give an opportunity to be working with you and you could be their first customer. So I think that there's so many different ways if we think about what we do day to day at work on how we can really be making inclusion a driver of the business. Great. I love those examples. That's definitely helpful. So let's talk a little bit about LinkedIn because you're such a leader in the LinkedIn space and you have a lot of very informative and also apparently provocative posts, even though they're not necessarily meant to be. Let's think about the responses that you're getting to some of your posts and what that tells you about how much work we still have to do to create change. For example, when you posted on the maternal wall, there was a lot of pushback 
from men. And again, I'm sure there's so many other situations when you've posted on different topics. And there's pushback from the people who are in the position of being privileged by the status quo. What can we do to create change and move this status quo along? Or are you saying, no, at least we're just having this conversation, right, that we've never had before. And that's already a start to the change. I think it's all of those things you mentioned. I love LinkedIn because I love the sense of community I feel from LinkedIn. I love teaching and learning. And so that's my preferred platform where I choose to do that. And you know what I'll say, Jacqueline, some of the things I post, I don't even think they're controversial. (laughs) I have experienced the maternal law. I have experienced the motherhood penalty. I have seen the fatherhood premium pay out, watch it play out in our relationship with my husband. So I'm like, huh? I am all about engagement on LinkedIn and dialogue. I respect people who have a different point of view. I think where it starts to cross the line is when it becomes hate, hate language, hate speech. And when it becomes a personal attack, I just wanted to personally thank you and say publicly on your podcast, thank you so much for showing up for me during that post, which had wild sort of conversation and engagement and a lot of men coming forward and saying, this isn't true. What period are you living in? We just went through the pandemic. None of this is true anymore. And you and a number of others came to my defense to say, yeah, you have seen this in in your research and in what you have read as well. And isn't that interesting though, that I always think, wow, what has triggered someone so badly that they feel like they have to write this like lengthy, sometimes not very nice response to what I post. You can just scroll on by. Exactly. So despite this, you still seem to have hope. How are you persevering and what do you do? Again, and it maybe relates back to how you manage your burnout. Like how do you manage your energy and how do you show up in this space to be able to keep going? And what are some of your goals in this space? What are some of the things you hope to achieve? I have one life to live. We all do. So I want to make as much impact as I can for as long as I'm here on this earth. And so that's how I try to lead my life. And yes, there are people who are going to disagree with me. And yes, there are some unkind comments and one of them might hurt for a day and then you bounce back again the next day right? People are entitled to their opinion and I'm entitled to my opinion. I'm not everyone's cup of tea on LinkedIn and that's fine. Like I said, you can scroll on by or you could choose not to engage with me. That's fine as well. But I I would love to be in a place someday, Jacqueline, where we don't have any chief diversity officer roles. I think we're a ways away from that, but imagine in a world where we didn't need the role because everyone just acted like their own CDO. And what keeps me hopeful is my children. I do this work for my children, for all of our children. I want their world to be different than the world in which I grew up in. And so I'm a half glass full person. That's why I do this work. So I see some green shoots and are there misses? Yes. And there's also pockets of progress. And so that's what I hold on to. Great, great. And interestingly, recently I engaged with a number of younger women. They were students and they felt like my story of working mom burnout really reflected back to them, their moms. And so then they asked me, you know, what can we do for our moms and what can we do for ourselves? And I got hope from that. I hadn't expected to engage with that group. And yeah, so I agree. There are these green shoots everywhere that can give us the energy to keep going for sure. So I know in your podcast, you call out to white allies to bring a chair up and listen, understand more from the perspectives and the stories. But what else can white allies do to educate themselves and support your work? First, start listening to our podcast. So I appreciate that Brown Table Talk podcast found on Apple and Spotify. I think really the journey of an ally is to place the burden of education on yourself and stop placing the burden on asking those who are, you are trying to show up for to educate you. Now, listen, D and I have a deep, deep friendship. I am on my journey to show up for the black community as an ally. Only she can tell you if I'm an ally or not for her. That's not for me to answer. At the same time, I have a trusting enough relationship with her that I've built over many years. And she feels the same way about me. We can ask each other some of these tough personal questions, but you have to have that trust. So I think for allies, it's like be on a journey to learn, build empathy for an experience that's not your own, but start to really focus on building those multicultural bridges. I always like to ask leaders this question, how do you spend your time on the weekends? Who are your neighbors? 
where do you do your grocery shopping? What do you do in the evenings? And when you have a life decision or something you want to celebrate, who are the five people who you'll call that aren't a part of your family? And if they all look like you, act like you and think like you, then let's be honest that we're self-segregating. And so part of doing this work is building meaningful relationships with people who aren't in your community. So how can I expect you to show up at work and act differently and think differently if you aren't doing this work at home in your personal relationships? And that's where it starts. That's great. And once again, Mita, you have this way of making these solutions sound so doable. I love that. I think that's so important. That's such a gift you bring to this. I think people do get very overwhelmed. There's so much we could be doing, should be doing. And just the questions that you're leaving us with here as listeners, they're very actionable. So I really appreciate that. So my last one, I think, and not to set you up to fail here, but I think you're going to give a great, great answer to this one. So I always like to end the interview with what is one behavior change that you would recommend for working moms and for companies to start today? What could working moms and or companies do to start today to change? Well, here's what I'll say. Leaders who are looking to support working mothers, I always say nothing for us without us. You cannot create solutions for a community without asking that community to have a seat at the table. So if I'm not a working mother, how do I know what to solve for? So you have to ask people what they want and what they need. And I think, Jacqueline, too often being a business leader, we're too often chasing what are we selling and how much are we selling and whom to. And our employees are a forgotten consumer. We're so focused almost externally to say, hey, what do you want? What do you need? Because you as a working mother, your needs might be different than mine. And you can't make assumptions that I want additional time off or I need additional time off, or maybe I don't. And so I think that's so important to just ask people what they want. Don't make assumptions. And for then moms themselves, any thoughts about what a mom could do? What do you do in your life to help you stay in balance? I always joke, I have no hobbies because I have children, (laughs) except I really enjoy writing. And that's what I do. I think find your outlet of whatever it is that provides you. I'm on a mission this year, Jacqueline. I said, I'm only going to try to focus on things that spark joy in my life in the time I have, right? That's outside of work and outside of personal obligations. Find something that sparks joy for you so that you can fill yourself up so that you can be there for the people who matter the most in your life to you. Thank you so much for listening in today. And as promised, I'm going to share a little bit more about my training and peer learning collaboratives for women leading change. And if you want to find any more about this, please direct message me on LinkedIn and I can provide additional details and access to my free masterclass on this topic. Like me, are you passionate about helping other women leaders? In When Women Lead, Julia Borston showed that venture capital-backed successful women are disruptive. Instead of the quick fixes preferred by men, they see both the forest and the trees, and they get to the root causes of problems. I want to give women the confidence and credibility to lead in this way and to build upon their intuition with science-backed leadership strategies. Are you fed up with the status quo for women in the workplace? You're overwhelmed with the ever-changing demands of today's work-life complexities. Change and growth is a business imperative. But how can you learn that big picture thinking while you're still stuck in the weeds? Are you worried about wasting time, money, and effort on DEI, wellness, and retention perks without lasting impact on culture change? Women are spending more time on these issues but are not being rewarded or recognized for this work in their performance evaluations. That would require systems change. Are you frustrated by providing band-aids and employee fixes to these complex problems, but you're unsure how to get buy-in for more meaningful systems-wide change? While women are still in the minority in leadership and the questions we ask make male leaders uncomfortable, We're going to continue to have our leadership style undermined, questioned, and dismissed. Even though women leaders have been shown to have greater impact on collective intelligence, productivity, and profits, and in medicine, our lives saved. 
So how do you increase your confidence and credibility as a female leader whose curiosity, compassion, and conscientiousness is really undervalued? The good news is the way successful women lead has a basis in science and can be learned. For over two decades, I've been researching and practicing how to create systemic change, how to create lasting behavior change, and how to create learning cultures that support transformational organizational change. By understanding how your leadership success is backed by science, you can have more confidence and credibility. You can embrace your approach with even more vigor, increasing your impact. And you can use big words to quieten those small-minded critics. I'll be that scientist in your back pocket. I will make your butt look bigger, but in a good way. You will be able to stand your ground from a position of strength. I'll provide you processes, tools, and strategies to disrupt the status quo and manage transformational change so that you can lead a thriving, diverse, productive, innovative, and engaged workforce. I'll provide an evidence-based roadmap to lead you through the current turbulent times, to help you find effective solutions to complex problems, to reduce your overwhelm and exhaustion, so you can lead through change and create the lasting change you want to see. My five science-backed evidence-based leadership strategies are leading through complexity with compassion, understanding root causes and solving multi-level problems using the social ecological model and lessons from public health. Leading with impact, identifying and operationalizing key change levers, using behavior change science and strategies to create sustainable habits that change systems. Leading with insight, creating the conditions for a culture of change using psychological safety, emotional intelligence, rewarding daily behaviors, and empowering role models. Leading with curiosity. Finding and testing new solutions for employee wellness, retention, and belonging. Using peer learning collaboratives as a supportive and science-based process for managing change and developing resilience. And finally, leading with clarity understanding and managing multifaceted burnout so you and those you lead can thrive through change using multi-level burnout solutions. In conjunction with my leadership training, I'm facilitating small groups of women executives in peer learning collaboratives. This is a scientific process that is used in medicine when important new recommendations need to be put into practice and there is likely to be pushback. Peer learning collaboratives leverage the supportive environment of group coaching, but with more targeted goals, greater accountability, and a quality improvement process that measures impact through learning cycles. They provide a safe environment for women to put their new skills and strategies into action while learning from other women leading similar change efforts in their organizations. Never before have we been through a global pandemic racial reckoning, mental health epidemic, or great resignation. With a recession looming, post-pandemic stress levels are likely to remain high and resources will be low. Reports from Deloitte, Microsoft, ADECO, and Modern Health show that employees are dissatisfied with the current fix the person solutions and want to see transformational change in the organization itself. The need to lead with impact and provide return on investment is greater than ever in more uncertain, challenging, and complex times than ever. My name, Jacqueline, means usurper, and I've been challenging the status quo since I was 10. I wanted to change the world, so that's what I became an expert in, behavior change. I'm in the top 1% of most cited scientists worldwide and led many paradigm shifting research programs. But my work was always about empowering communities to develop leaders of change. I love solving complex problems like childhood obesity, maternal mortality, and workplace burnout. And why burnout? Because I'm a burnout survivor myself. So when I help you, 
It comes from a place of caring, compassion, and curiosity. I love learning, and I want to find out what really works. During these times of monumental change, there have been few guiding frameworks for leaders. There are not yet evidence-based solutions to these new emerging and urgent problems. So it's even more essential to use evidence-based processes to manage change. My behavior science tools will enable you to embrace complexity, lead through change and manage the overwhelm. I want to help women leaders with a new playbook for compassionate and competent leadership in times of change and complexity with evidence-based frameworks and strategies for moving beyond the status quo and leading the workforce of the future. I understand how hard and scary change can be. So the next step is to take my free masterclass to find out more about how these tools and strategies can help you. I want you to be comfortable and informed before you invest in my training or peer learning collaborative so that you get the help you need. And you can also learn more about my style to assess if I am the guide you want on this journey. Direct message me on LinkedIn to access the masterclass and the training and peer learning collaboratives will be starting in 2023. Thanks so much for your time. And please remember, burnout can be related to serious health problems. If you're experiencing physical or mental health symptoms, please contact a health provider or call the appropriate helpline. This podcast does not replace medical advice. Take care. Take control, you're a fighter. Push the limits and see. Feel the pain.